everybody, welcome back to episode four of Musical Journeys. Today I'm with the beautiful, talented Angela Hacker. Angela, yeah, Angela was a staff writer at Fame, right? I was for a little while. And you're a studio singer? Correct. Musician? Kinda. Kinda. And the winner of Nashville Star 2007, which was... Correct, 10 years ago. Which was series number five? Year five? Season five? Season five, yeah. Okay, season, season five. five. And almost my bandmate for two years. That's correct. Almost, almost. So we're going to talk about Angela's killer path through music from the very beginning. Literally, it's almost killed me. <laughs> <laughs> to today. So let's talk about Word. let's talk about your beginnings. I know a lot about it, but I want like to how far back you want all the way to the beginning. Family, like family and stuff. Well, From the first time you even thought about playing music, and what it was that made you want to play music, you know. I always gravitated um, to music, like an early age. My dad was, um, you know, a guitar player. He played drums. He um, wrote songs, and he wrote songs for a gentleman here in Sheffield, actually, and I really can't remember his name because I was so young okay. when all that was going on, but he was in the loop, and he and two of his brothers played. So there's always musical instruments around. I have three older sisters, and the, my two oldest sisters, they played and sang and wrote songs. Guitar, keyboards, piano. Um, they played guitar and um, piano, and we had an old, um, an old upright piano in our house when I was little and we played on it all the time and I would you know listen to my mom you know she would spend time because my mother could sing also and she was in her high school choir so she knew like how to you know she kind of trained them how to sing harmonies mm -hmm. and so my sister Lisa and Denise and then our cousin Deanna, and I say that because I have a sister named Deanna too. But right, right. anyways, our cousin Deanna, the three of them would sit around and practice songs like The Rose. And my mom would teach them how to do that three-part harmony. Yeah. And anytime music was going on, which was a lot, you know, even if we weren't playing, the, you know, mom would put records on and whatnot. And I just always liked it. And then by the time I was... Um, Seven, I didn't ever sing in front of my family though. I did it privately in the bedroom with the radio going you know, with my little bootleg tapes that I would, you know, record off of the top 40 on the weekend. And by the time I was seven, I started picking up the guitar and my sister, I can't remember if it was Lisa or Denise, but one of them were playing Knocking on Heaven's Door. And they weren't even playing it right. They mostly were playing it right, but they were leaving out the C. They were just doing G, D, and A minor, mm -hmm. and um, I was like, how do you make that chord? And so I, I learned that way just by being shown, you know, G, D, C, over, till I got, you know, till I could do the basics. Right, right. And then um, by the time I was 10, I was playing around with writing songs, and I'm sure they were all terrible, but, you know, it was just kind of like I started writing pretty early. And uh, I wanted to do that because I couldn't play a lot of songs. So what, I kind of, what kind of songs were you playing? Like you're doing covers at home at that age. What would it be? Um, I don't know who did this song, or if I can even remember the name. I'm trying to remember this. I think it was somebody like Mary Chapin Carpenter or something. Right. Um, I can't remember the song. Like it escapes me. But I used to play it that all the time. And then older songs like. Uh, when you're only lonely, yeah. stuff like that. Right. Um, knocking on heaven's door, obviously. And then, like, my sister would sit around and play uh, whatever country song that she was into. And so, I, I, whatever they were into, I was into. Right. And so, it was kind of, you know, some country. So, you're picking up some of the guitar from them. Some of it from them, but mostly just sitting around for hours. Once I learned where my fingers were supposed to go. Yeah. And a lot of things I learned incorrectly because they had learned incorrectly. Right. And then through the years, I picked up maybe the cor more correct way to do certain things. Yeah. So I would just learn where my fingers are supposed to go and then sit around for hours because there was really nothing else to do. I grew <laughs> up way in the sticks, you know, so. And that was where? Uh, LaGrange. It's known as LaGrange Mountain. 
It's really not a mountain, and I don't know why they call them that. And then but it's Lagrange in Alabama. Yeah, yeah. It's it's you know it's you would say if you if you go to another place and you tell somebody where you're from, you're going to say if you're me, you're going to say the Shoals area because I'm from the surrounding area, area of that. Right. They're not going to know right. Lagrange, Lagrange Mountain, yeah. you know. Right. So you kind of do that, but um, yeah, Lagrange Mountain. If you drive about 30 minutes from here, uh, from here right. it's out in the county, Colbert County, which is, you know, yeah. this county. But um, it's that's country. where I'm from. There's in the country. At, way in the country, yeah, way in the country. So nothing. that's where it started. So you start playing at home. Cool. So you're, was there any particular artist that, that stuck out to you? Like, Yeah. Like, uh, I loved um, Whitney Houston. Um, you know, I liked big singers, Tina Turner, and then my sister Denise, she had, you know, cassettes were the thing when right, I was right. young. and so, Mixed tapes. Yeah, well, this was an actual uh, or the cassette album yeah, of, yeah. Uh, it was an Aretha Franklin, like, greatest hits type thing, and it had 30-something songs on it. Wow. And um, one whole side of it I loved, and the other side I wasn't into any of those, but, like, the first side was, like, uh, uh, Never Loved a Man. Uh, do right woman um, and a lot of, of other songs that she cut and I loved that so I liked strong singers you were hearing these songs when you were really young yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, a lot of R&B my dad sang a lot of Ray Charles and even though they were known as a, a country uh, music kind of thing um, he did a lot of looking back he did like little Richard and stuff from the 50s that was technically in that time rock and roll right. um, or R&B. Right. So there was a mixture of that. You know, we listened to George Jones and Merle Haggard and I loved all of that. Dolly Parton and uh, I loved Reba McIntyre. Oh my God. <laughs> I was like such a Reba freak that I would even make myself sound like her right. to a fault right. for in my young teenage right. years. Yeah. That's and, um and it wasn't until like I got to be, I think I was like a junior or senior, and I switched schools on my own account, on my own accord. I, I went from a, a small uh, county school in Lawrence County called Hatton High School, and I moved to Russellville High School, which was a lot bigger than where I'd been because I wanted to take, you know, choir and um, theater. Yeah. And they ha offered that there. And I'm really glad I did it, even though it was, was hard, you know, switching schools from the people I grew up with. But anyways, it was cool because I got to do a lot of music by switching to there. Right. And uh, I had a point with where I was going with all that, but I don't remember what it was. Oh, I do remember what it was. It, uh, we were in the gym. I never took PE, but I took PE my junior year because I didn't really need a lot of classes. Anyways, we're, we're in there and the lady would let us listen to music and somebody's got something playing and I'm, I'd never heard it that I could recall anyway. Yeah. And I was like, what is that? And she's like, that's Pink Floyd. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, you know, and it was, it was Dark Side of the Moon yeah. and I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. And then I, I found Zeppelin like a year later. Uh -huh. And then I started going from the, the country, country girl that I had been doing all the Reba and wearing the Western shirts and the boots to wanting to be straight up rock and roll. Right. You know, so. Um, so you had told me one time about the, the uh, at that school that you took drama, mm -hmm. right? And then you started singing in the productions. Yeah, yeah, we did. They were big time stuff for a high school. And you said trip. that one of the teachers really encouraged you. He was great, you know, because um, he didn't care. Like, you know, my mom had to work all the time and she had, you know, obviously other responsibilities. She couldn't, she wasn't one of those parents that could always like be up her child's butt right. and, you know, dictate everything going on. And a lot of times, especially in, in the school I was in, it kind of seemed like you were kind of overlooked. If, if you weren't a sportsman, <laughs> you right, know, right. that was pretty much all they had to offer right. that I saw anyway right, right. That, when I was that, there. That you were interested in. Uh, that I was interested in. And, and when I went to Russell, Donnie Bryan was the, uh, the, the theater guy, the drama troop leader, and he had been on Broadway and, and had done a lot of stuff, and he was, wow, he was good. And he just encouraged me, you know, he made me 
be in their Miss RHS pageant because they had a talent category. I, I don't do pageants, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> I did twice. Right. And, you know, just so I could sing. And, you know, we, I had to do a lot of, you know, show tunes, mm -hmm. which I wasn't really into show tunes at all. But I liked, I liked acting. It was fun. Right. It right. was really fun. Yeah, that's a cool thing. Now, the band, acoustic stuff that you did around town and the bands, I mean, when you went started performing, tell me how that started and progressed. Well, after high school, I was really naive, and I thought the red carpet was going to be laid out for me. You know, in Nashville, I was just going to be so good that they were just going to just say, here you go, here's yeah. a deal. <laughs> and, you know, but obviously it doesn't work that way. And um, so I, I got a regular job. Um, you know, my mom was like, good luck, you know, <laughs> get a job. <laughs> and, uh, and so I did, and um, I always still played and wrote. But at that time, I didn't really, you know, know that people were like, at fame, writing songs and making a really good living at it. Like, right. you know, people go, wow, you, you're sitting on a gold mine here and you didn't even know it. And I didn't. I was, I was so dumb, so naive, and, um, and really scared to, you know, um, to, to do anything different besides what I was doing. And so I got a job at a... I worked at a meat packing plant for about a month, and then I went to a t-shirt factory and like sewed t-shirts for a year and a half. And all the while, I'm like, you know, learning how to be out on my own and pay bills and you you know, buy my first oh, car. Yeah. And I was like 18, okay. 19. Yeah. And um, then I, you know, I'd always been in little bands here and there. I, my first right. band was like, I was like 14 or 15. Yeah, you told me there was older guys with you, right? Well, no. Uh -huh. Well, the first time, yeah, there was like a couple of guys that were coaches at the school. And then the second band was a uh, Gary Nichols, who obviously a lot of people know who he is because he plays with the Steel Drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in a band with him and some other young people. In fact, the, the name of the band was called Young Country. Yeah. But I only lasted a few weeks in that band because there was another female singer and it just didn't work out, you know. Yeah. I, so I moved on and, and um, sang some and uh, other local bands would kind of bring me in and get me up and sing. And mm -hmm. So anyways, I, I finally, my brother, I had these several jobs, you know, several day jobs, all the while playing gigs with different bands, right. writing songs, trying to record, but not really knowing anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I, I wound up quitting my day job, the last day job I had, and um, was about to be evicted. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had this really good friend, and, and, um, and she was like, why don't you play a gig? you know, by yourself. I had been playing gigs with my brother right. and that wasn't working out so much anymore. So I was like, I just can't do a gig by myself. I'm not good enough to play. Do a gig. She's like, yeah, you can, yeah, you can. So I didn't want to do it, but I was about to be evicted. And uh, she called me on the phone one day and she was like, do you want this gig here in Decatur? It pays a hundred dollars. And, uh, you know, you play from this, this amount of time. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And she was like, "Good, because I already told you." You're already in. And so that's kind of that kind of started that. But right. I skipped over a pretty good bit of stuff because when I was in my teens, I met Ava Aldridge. Yeah, you told me. And I did a bunch of stuff with her. So, although all through the time that like my when I first started singing in front of people, which was when I was about thirteen, to this time that I'm talking about, you know, uh, late teens, early twenties. I've been playing gigs and writing songs and, you know, and now I've started to play gigs on my own and realized that I could make money right. doing my thing. Right. And I had already been a published writer at this point. Um, Mike O'Rear uh, was a publisher, had a, had a publishing house on the row in Nashville and he would take me up there a few times a week and, you know, I'd write with different people and mostly I wrote by myself. and. Um, Got a few songs demoed, and um, so Ava's role. What, tell, let's talk about Ava and what she did. Or who, who she, she heard me, who and she a, is. And yeah, well, she's a, she was a successful songwriter, right? And she was also one of the background singers that sang on a ton of stuff that came out of you know the Shoals uh, sound that that the stuff that went on here. Right. She sang, you know, her and um, Marie Louie 
and I can't uh, Cindy Cindy Richardson um, you know they were they sang background you know that big mm -hmm. kind of chorusy sounding background stuff on a lot of records. a lot of records right. and um, and she had a she had a hit with uh, Dr. Hook called Sharing the Night Together. Right. And then she uh, ended up later on having a, uh, I think a country number one with um, Sawyer Brown. Yeah. And so, you know, she was, she had a studio in her house. Right. And, but the first time I met her was at a contest and she asked me to come over and just kind of sing. Right, so she kind of to mentored you music. a little bit. Or... She did it through my teenage years. And right. then our thing kind of, we kind of parted ways when I turned 18. And I went directly from working with her to working with uh, Mike O'Rear, mm -hmm. and um, that my sister Denise had worked with him some. Okay. And he heard me and was like, listened to a few of my songs and signed me as a writer. Wow. So. And how old were you then? Um, I was still. Uh, I was probably like 18 the first time he signed me. Wow. And I stayed signed with him, and then by the time I was 20. I was pregnant with my son, right. and um, so I kind of hiatus there, you know, for the time that I was pregnant. I still sang in, in a band. I had a rock band at the time, right. and I did that, wrote songs, and then after he was born, it was probably, he was probably close to a year old before I started doing gigs again right. and, and um, getting back in the swing of that. And then um, you just kept on going. It, yeah, and I, I ended up divorcing my husband. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't remember. Maybe I was. I think I was 23 mm -hmm. or 24 by the time I div we divorced. And um, I had a job at a car dealership. <laughs> I'm so not me. I just struggled with that one. <laughs> I'm not a salesman. I thought it was funny the first time she yeah. ever got in my Ford uh, Explorer. I was able to. Switch the time and fix it for me. <laughs> yeah. Like, so what are you doing? You know, got to do that. <laughs> they were good to me there, but I was. No, I'm not a salesman. I'm not a salesperson at right, all, and right. I have a hard time with that. Just you know, doing music, but uh, you know, I was doing that and not doing a whole lot of gigging at all. Right. I had pretty much gotten out of it. Had a lot going on in my little crazy personal life at the time, and. My brother called me on the phone and was like, I'm sick and I gotta do this gig and I really need some help. Will you please come out and help me do this? And I said, sure. And he's like, I'll pay you. So I'm, there you go, you're talking my language now. I'm gonna get paid. So I go and, and we sang, we did, he played acoustic and then I just kind of sang with him and then some songs he knew that I sang. Mm -hmm. And so we did that and then the next time he went to play another gig, they were like, is your sister gonna be with you? You know, so it just kind of became a thing, and we did a thing there for, you know, a little while, and then of course it worked into me doing gigs by myself, and and then from there I met Jimmy uh, Nutt, mm -hmm. who was the house engineer at the time at Fame. I didn't have a, a, a publishing deal with Fame yet, but they would kind of bring me in. People were bringing me in to sing backgrounds or whatever demos, mm -hmm. and. Um, Somebody told me Jimmy had a studio in his house, and I had saved some money, and I had these songs I wanted to put down. And um, Jimmy was like, "Yeah, you know, come, you know, we'll do that." So we set up a time, and that was really, you know, I would say my first time to be like in working with somebody like Jimmy, even though you know his studio was in his house that let let me sit there and play the guitar to a click mm -hmm. and then we would think about what else we were going to put on it and then we would bring in other players to do like drums and bass and guitar right and he was really good to me uh letting me do that stuff and then at some point i was like he's like when are we going to get back on this and i'm like well i kind of ran out of money i'm gonna have to save and he's like don't worry about it I'll work on it in my spare time, and and he did, and, and we ended up finishing like an EP, like a five song right. thing, but I, I ended up not following through with that project, but what we did do was, was a lot of fun. So it's just been, you know, the process of, yep. you know, you doing what you do. So you're back out there, and then Nashville Star happens. Well, yeah, I went some years yeah. throwing anything, any iron I could into the fire, writing songs and getting them licensed out in L.A. to 
be put in a movie or whatever. And um, I don't think they ever used any of my stuff, but I did get paid to let them shop some of my stuff and mm -hmm. playing gigs and playing in different bands. And um, my sisters were fans of the show. And um, they told me for like two or three years, you need to go audition, you need to go out. And I was like, mm, you know. And um, Johnny Holland, who's also an artist, singer, songwriter from around here, really good guy, called me up on the phone and was like, I guess this was like September of 06, and it was the first round of auditions in Atlanta. And he's like, man, me and three or four other people were driving over and we're gonna audition. And I was like, eh, you know, I don't know, man. I, I don't really do good hanging out with a bunch of people I don't know and blah. And um, he was like, well, I think you should go, but you think about it. We're gonna be leaving this day. Short story long, I, did, I went. Mm -hmm. And so we all got a call back. I mean, it was like the line was crazy. You had to wait hours and you know, and then you get in there and you got like so many seconds the first day to get up there and just a cappella sing. And then they they called all of us in our group back wow. for the next day. That's great. And uh, which was cool. Right and then on. so we're all there the second day and I got to play guitar and you had to pick from a song list. And so I did that. And then Johnny told me that while I was singing, because um, I sang strawberry, a piece of strawberry wine okay. in that second audition. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I called up my sister and said, is this the words right here? Because I couldn't really remember. Right. <laughs> so um, he said while I was singing Strawberry Wine that uh, one of the judges that day was holding up his phone, you know, like he was oh, letting right. someone else listen. hear. Right. And he's like, you're going to go, you're going to go. Well, I really didn't give it a second thought. Right, right. Because I just didn't, you know, I don't really look like the TV personality. Right. And, um outgoing is not my thing either so you know I was just doing it to say that I did and then a few months later I'm getting a phone call saying that in fact I thought that the deadline had already passed and I hadn't heard anything so I figured okay well it's done, deal. It's done. right but they they called me and I was actually I was at the school picking up Bay from school and I'm in the line <laughs> waiting for him to come out the door and I get the call and they're like on a on a board in a boardroom with me on speakerphone, they're telling me that I made the show, oh, wow. and he's like, and I've got a surprise for you. Your brother also made the show, because he went and did the last round of auditions, and I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, cool. <laughs> I think, and, uh, you know, so I didn't know any of what that was going to entail, but you know, that's kind of how that went. Yeah, and then you hit the stage on TV. What's that like the first time? It was scary for me. <laughs> It was really scary for me. I'm real shy, unless you really know me. Right, right. <laughs> I'm pretty shy. You know, you, you're afraid of, you know, you're going to get made fun of. And all the same things you're afraid of the first time you ever set foot on any stage. Right, right. Playing and uh, singing. And so I was really scared. And what, um, you know. And then the uh, the critiques from the judges. Yeah, I... I cringe when I watch that stuff now. My my son will pull that up sometimes, some of the stuff, and I'm like, please cut that off. Because <laughs> I can just see by the way that I'm like, my demeanor is at that time, how uncomfortable I was right, right. in that. Right. I was super uncomfortable in, in the show part, right? you know, where it's live. Not so much when we're doing like, you know, the interviews and stuff like this. Right, it, be real. It was... Um, but on live show. on TV, you know, it was, was kind of, you know, right. and then they put you on the spot, you know, and you, you're supposed to say something. And, you know, unfortunately, everything I said was edited to make me look like the only thing I ever talked about was my son or something else <laughs> negative. But not that there's anything wrong with talking about your kids. It's just like, you know, I caught a lot of flack. Uh, from other people that don't even know me right. about that and they said you used your son oh, as a way to get ahead and I'm like man that's just how they edited it right, you, you know I had no that's control the over what they put out there that's the way it goes. and that's another fear when you're doing that you don't know what they're oh, gonna okay. they can edit it to make you really look like you're saying anything right because they've got so much of what you've said you better not do that to me on this uh, so oh, I won't do that to you but um yeah it's just kind of a 
wild. That, that was like a blur. It was it had some really good moments, like the homecoming when um, it was. I guess the show was a few seasons from being over. Right. And um, you know it was down to the nitty gritty, down to a few contestants, and then we did like a homecoming show. And so the main guys came with me and Zach back to here, uh-huh. and we, you know, did some stuff. And I didn't really realize how big it was until we came home to do that. Right. And we had a police escort <laughs> to the Hall of Fame to do a signing. Right. And they were giving us keys to the city, <laughs> and wow. people wrapped around that building like five and six deep. Wow. And it was cold outside, and they're standing in the cold just to come through a line that's hours long to say hey and get something signed. And it was like, wow. that was an emotional point for me. Wow. I was like, holy crap. That's crazy. You know, that's, it was really, really, really that is weird. Crazy. <laughs> it was weird. So you go through the process at Nashville Star, and you, you get down to the end, and you're the winner. Yeah. Then what happens? How do you feel first at the end? Man, I'm awful because, like, I'm, you're in show business, right? Mm-hmm. And so, part of your the big, a big part of your business is being with people, right? Right. And by that time, all I wanted to do was go back to the room, and and you know what I'm saying, have a drink, right? And chill out. Right. I was exhausted after you know every a lot of people, my family, and a lot of people, the halls, Rick and Linda Hall uh, from you know fame, right. They would come up every week for the show, and I, you know, made sure everybody got in, and um, which was very cool. They were so supportive, and after every show, we would all converge on, you know, uh, Dave and Buster's because that was like the biggest place close by, right, and right. they'd have it on a big screen in there, like <laughs> re- sh- rerunning it. Oh, really? Okay. And um, and I'd be in there, and that was fun, like the first two or three weeks. Right. And then I got to where I felt obligated to like, you know, and and I remember a couple of friends I went to school with at Hatton showed up after one of the tapings at Dave and Buster's and we're sitting at a table, just us. Everybody else is over here having a great time because everybody was, you know, proud of of me and Zach. They were like, you know, we're glad people are getting to see y'all. Sure. And I was too, but it was, I, I think that was at the point where I was, it would, didn't take much to overwhelm me. Right, right. And I was overwhelmed. And um, I'm just sitting there, and they're talking to me, and they're asking me questions like you're asking me. You yeah, know, sure. what do you th- feel about this? And I'm just kind of like laying there on the table. <laughs> and I really didn't know how I felt about it at the time. Right. I just wanted to, you like, just tired, hide. Wore out, wore out tired. Well, you know, just kind of, I didn't know if it was going to go in the direction that was really going to represent me as a singer. Okay. And as a, you know, what songwriting I do, and um, you know, and it's, um, I just didn't know. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty, and even though you people are going, we like your voice, you're singing other people's songs, right. and um, right. you know, I just, it's what I thought I always wanted was an opportunity, and um, I think I just kind of shied away from it a little bit when I, because I had a, a huge opportunity. Yeah through that. But it was overwhelming, as you said. To you. I, I was not equipped. Right. Um, well, and I had other problems that I was unaware of at the time, too. Right. And they manifested later. Well, there's a lot of people who are, but, uh, you know, with that kind of fame and attention that all of a sudden it just sort of... And I just got a smidgen, you know, know, of what it might would be like to be somebody to, that that is out there doing something like that. Now, I can't imagine to be, you know, like on a larger scale, I, I think now I would handle all of that completely different. Right. Um, because I'm in a much better place now sure. than I was um, four and a half years ago. And, I, you know, it had took a while. Even after the show, I went through some stuff. Yeah. And I'm glad I did. And I think, you know, uh, the show, just like anything else, just like the first talent show I, I ever sang in front of anybody, all of it, you know, is part of the story. Right, part of your and, um, journey. And I sure. sing and play because it's what I do. Right, and you love it. And Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, if you don't to. love this, right. you don't need to right. be here. <laughs> and it's work. You know, sometimes it's work and you don't want to do it, but it's still, for me, it's it's like, what else am I going to do? I'm like, I'm a singer. Yeah. That's first and foremost, and I like to write songs, and I play guitar, and so 
I'll be doing that whether I'm getting paid for it or not. Sure. So you, you, you win the contest and I, I watched it so I remember the whole thing and vivid detail. So what are you thinking at that moment when you win? <laughs> or do you want to tell me? I don't, know. I don't really know. I, I think a part of me was kind of hoping Zach was going to win. Oh, really? I think a part of me was hoping he was going to win. And man, Zach brought it. Like when he's saying lady, mm -hmm. I mean, he kicked that song's ass because he's a great singer, you know. Right. And I was like, man, he he's going to do this, you know. But... I had some people, people that just worked in the crew and stuff, they just said things to me that kind of made me think, I might win. And it kind of freaked me out. Yeah. I think I was just, I think I was excited. Right. And and because you feel like I'm, I'm being validated, you know? Sure, sure. There are people out there that like what I do and, and I love to sing and they like it. Hey, that's great. And then, you know, you're looking at your kid that you hadn't really hung out with in two months, you know, and except for a few moments after the show. Right, and, right. On and, TV. Uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, just a lot of stuff, you know, and I, like I said, I wasn't equipped so, yeah, you're just to deal with any of it. You conflicted a little bit about it all. Yeah, you know, you're, you're happy, you're freaked out, you're all yeah. these, but it was, it was a lot of fun. I don't mean to make it sound like, yeah. you know, terrible, because it wasn't. Do you think somebody like Casey Musgraves was actually lucky not to be the winner? You know, I think a lot of people put a stigma on people that go on those shows. Sure. And I, I definitely felt like there was a negative uh, kind of a, um, what's the word, um, pushback from folks I came into contact with in Nashville. Uh, some in my own circle here in my sure. hometown. Because of the... That they were kind of like, oh, you're a sellout because you did a show. Right. You know, and I don't really get that. I mean, if you're 15 and you've never played a gig before and you just decide, oh, I think I want to be a singer one day, and you happen to wind up on American Isle or The Voice or something, and, and then you're thrown out there, that's one thing. But I had been singing for a long time. and playing gigs yeah. and writing songs for a publisher in Nashville for some years. So yeah. I yeah. paid yeah. lots of dues. Lots of dues yeah. It's not like I just showed up one day and like, oh, I think I want to be a <laughs> singer. You know, that don't happen. Right. And um, right. and when it does, people don't stay because when they find out what it takes, it, it, they, they they most of them don't do it. Right. And um, it's either in your blood or it ain't. Um, so just so everybody knows, Casey Musgraves was on the season that Angela. Yes, yeah, she was my roommate. She was a roommate, and, uh, and and I knew she was great then. Yeah, and she she's, was great. And then. She's done great things, and you know that that show's had a few successes. You know, Miranda yeah. and, and some other folks. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and all those people were pretty. Like even Miranda had a, a pretty. Well, I mean, for what, all I'm saying, you know, there was some there was some negative feedback from yeah. being on the show, but aside from that, you know. What I did or did not do was all on me. Sure. You know what I mean? It wasn't, you know, I didn't get the best deal from winning the show. Mm -hmm. um, the, the company that um, I won, the, that put out the record after the show, they're, they're not really into promoting that. Yeah. Um, they do it because they signed on for it and they get stuck with whoever wins, you know. Right. So that's not really exciting to them and they didn't want to go any further with me. I didn't find that out to a year later. Right. But like there was there were there were plenty of opportunities that arose yeah. for me right. through that show. Right. And um and I just wasn't able to capitalize on them not because I tried and failed, but because I had you know, yeah. I was conflicted right. uh, with right. a lot of right. things, right. and so I came home, and I pretty much didn't answer my phone for a long time. You know, there was management firms, big big management firms that offered to work with me, um, other record companies that showed interest in me, and I just didn't. I wasn't able to really do you anything. Engage with that. Yeah, I just wasn't yeah, able you're, to. You're done. Go anywhere for then for then anyway. But yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, but. Out of those, out of that show, there were some unique experiences that happened. Totally. So you told me one time that you were on the Opry. Oh, that was like the ice in the Talk cake. About it. Well, I mean, just when you won the show, like they said, you know, you're going to get to be on the Grand Ole Opry. 
well, that was to me cooler than winning a truck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, even though I like all kinds of music, if it moves me, I like it. I don't care what genre it is. Right. That is like, you know, if you're a country music fan, which I am, right? Um, or I used to be, um, that's like, you know, that's just yeah, kind of like, like, to me, it's, it's that's huge. And so when I got to do that, I took my dad right. and his brother that, he was one of his brothers that he was in the band with because the other one was deceased or I took him too. Right, right. But I took them and they were like kids in a candy store. They had the best time and seeing that right. was first of all the bomb. And then they asked me, they were like, you know, do you want, do you need a mic stand? And I didn't need a mic stand, but I wanted one. And I was like, mother, please go out front and get a picture of me standing in front of that stand that's got the Grand Ole Opry thing around oh, yeah, it. I was yeah. like, I want documentation <laughs> right. that I was here. And then after I was on it once, they invited me back. Yeah. They, they dug it and they invited me back and I did it again. And Zach sang with me. And then they asked me back again. And by that time I was on the tour, the Nashville Star Tour. Right. And I wasn't able to do it. And so I hate that because right. they're really nice at that place. Right. They're nice. That's cool. And Porter Wagner introduced me on the, the one of the times I was there. <laughs> that's, that's really, really cool. That is cool. Met that's Whispering Bill. Super you know. cool. So, so LP so Field. This is one that you guys had talked about the other day or a while back, just a while back with me. I didn't even know about it, but you played at LP Field. Right. For Fan Fest? It was CMA Festival. Yeah, CMA Festival. That they do every year. Right. And you and James were there. Yeah. Yeah, it's that... NLP, stadium, MLP you know. field. Yeah. <laughs> On stage. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, it was, you know, we're obviously, we weren't the main act. There right. Were other acts coming on <laughs> yeah, that well, night. So they, they weren't all there to see me, but it was, it was, that was pretty amazing. I, somebody took a bunch of pictures of really? us from the big screens that oh, they yeah. have. Wow. Um, and they sent them to me or they gave them to me at a gig. And um, cool. I still got them, awesome. and I can see on my face how freaking amazed I was. Cause it's just <laughs> like you can't stop smiling. And it was just me and James, two vocals, two acoustics, and we did a couple of songs. And then as soon as I walked off the stage, um, I'm trying to think. It was somebody, one of the higher ups in the business, was just you know they just acted blown away. Wow. Cool. You know, so you just kind of feel like, wow, maybe I'm doing something. That's pretty cool. Right. I don't That's know. That's pretty cool. So my, my final four questions, these are the ones that I repeat, but sometimes I change a little bit. In one word, describe your feelings about music. One word. Golly, man. That's a terrible oh, question. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there man. There it is. Um, music in one word? Yeah. There's so many emotions that Just go with one. music. I can't, I don't think I can pick one. Okay. If I, if I think of one that I feel like, you, you know, You'll tell me. I will tell you. Okay. And you can, right. you know. State of the music business. State of the, I think it's probably the same as it ever was. Yeah, exactly. You know, you've always got people that are really, really talented, but they don't have the work ethic. Yeah. Like me. <laughs> and then you've got people that maybe they're not the best singers or songwriters, but they would do anything and wear anything and say anything to get the opportunity to be out there doing it. Yeah. Um, uh, the only thing that is different to, that I can see, because I, I don't go to Nashville anymore. I, I've got one co-writer that every great once in a while we still get together because we've written some really good songs. Right. But I don't go t to the town to do much anymore. Right. Um, so I'm kind of out of the loop, but from what I hear, I'm talking to my significant other and other people, is that there aren't, that a lot of the great songwriters are leaving town. Mm. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that's a shame if that is true, because that is what makes country music great, And that's because, great of, the, because is of, the, the song. of the situation with the payments and you know, being able to be a, a viable career. Well, you know, records, the times are changing right. as far as you don't, people don't go buy a physical CD right. much right. anymore. Right. But um, on the other hand, vinyls have come back. Right. But I mean, you're, you're talking about the difference in yeah, 10 small. million yeah, versus, a very small. you yeah. know, maybe sure. 100,000 sure. or 300,000. Sure. At least a clue. If you get gold now, it's a big deal. Right. Or that used of course. to, of course it is. you know, it's a, 
I guess it was always a big deal, but you know what I mean, like there for a while. Yeah, yeah. So the, those mechanical royalties aren't what they used to be. Gotcha. You really have to have a hit, I think, as a songwriter on radio to make, money. To make really good money. Yeah. Um, and by a hit, I mean like a top ten or a number one. Right, right. So aspiring young musicians' advice to them, anybody that's coming up. Do your thing, <laughs> whatever that is. And, you know try new stuff but don't chase your tail too long trying to please somebody else you know stay true to what you're doing and allow it to to happen as it happens i still do that especially with songs and and don't be afraid you know if people like it great and if they don't that's okay too because you know because you're doing what's in you to do and um that's something i wish i could have told my younger self Actually, that's kind of how I felt early on. And then you get sidetracked along right, the way. Right. But it's all a part of the process. Right. Learn to like the process because it's not about the destination, man. It's, it's about everything else in between. The journey. The dash. It's all about what's happening in the dash. All right, last question. How do you create, what, when, do you, when you do creative writing, what, what is the process? Do you just play with your guitar and... I don't have a set way. Okay. So it's just different But style. I am melodically driven. And when I sit down and write a song by myself, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, I'll play around, noodle, whatever, mm -hmm. and come up with some chords that I like the way they sound together. And then I'll maybe hum over that. And then from there, this is probably crazy, no. but to me, like, I, I try to put the words that match the sound of that melody. Right. But I always have a topic in mind and a lot of times I have a, a title in mind as well. Okay. I don't, it's really hard to write a song, especially by yourself, so I'm crazy for doing that, but um, I'm slower than most people, so I don't do great with, with co-writing. But like to have a, have a title that you wanna write because if you start out just kind of meandering, you know, that's probably what the song's going to be like. It's just meandering and never hitting a point. Right, right. So I usually have, you know, melody moves me first, but I usually have some titles I want to write. And then... Does it come to you? Just, yeah, just thinking, sometimes just they thinking. do. Sometimes they do. And like I said, there's really no set way for me. Right. I have just started stuff just come to me mm -hmm. and just start spitting it out and go, okay, well, that's cool. Well, what am I going to say now? Well, what does that mean? What's that about? And then right. sometimes stuff just seems to fall out of the sky. <laughs> right, which is always awesome. <laughs> well, and if it, honestly, for me, if it don't happen that way, I, I'm not really a writer. Not really. You know, writers write whatever the subject matter, and I'm not like that. I got you. Yeah, otherwise, it's you, very personal. They write for on me. a on a schedule. Well, they write on a schedule, but I mean, like literally, the people that I've worked with. They're so good. Mm -hmm. They're such good writers that you could take them any subject matter. And they, could write. they don't have to be personally connected with it. Right. And they can write a well-written song in not that long. Right. And I'm just sitting there going, what? You know, because it's for me, it's a it's a emotional thing. It's a personal thing. Right. You have to connect to. It. They're not always autobiographical when I write a song. Right. There's some fiction to it also, but it's usually a subject matter that that I'm connected with in some kind of way. Cool. Well, I appreciate you taking some time with me today. Cool. And make sure you check out Nature of the Beast, James LeBlanc's new album where Angela is the guitar player, acoustic guitar player. and it's Not on the record, but live. Live with a live band and singing. Singing on the record for and sure. And we might see them on the road here soon. I have a song on that record too. So Nature of the Beast, James LeBlanc, and Angela Hacker on there. Subscribe to the channel, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of Musical Journeys. <laughs>